Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. This podcast is part two of a two-parter. They had a fantastic guest on the last podcast, and that is Jeff Savlov. Jeff is a consultant to enterprising families and is the founding principal of Blum and Savlov LLP, family business and wealth consulting. Jeff's specialty is working with families who want their wealth to serve current and future generations in healthy and productive ways. That being said, if you have not heard that first podcast, please, by all means, go back and listen to it either before this one or after you get done listening to this one. This will definitely be a standalone with all the information Jeff brings. Gentlemen, how are you? John and Michael, I'm so glad you brought it back. Yeah, we're excited. Nice to talk to you again, Eric. Yeah, it's good to talk to you guys. Yeah, this is going to be great. Jeff, thank you so much for being on again. Yeah, thanks for having me again. It's great. I had fun last time. Let's do it. Right. So we're going to do a little bit of a different turn. I'm looking forward to this discussion because we're going to talk about developing the next generation in a family business. And obviously, we at Copper Beach, we're a family business. And Jeff, I know you have been involved in a family business in your past life, for lack of a better term. So I think we're going to have a really good conversation here, but maybe you could touch on a little bit kind of your history in the family business world. Yeah, sure. And technically, I'm currently in a family business. You know, my my firm, Blum and Savlov, LLP, Family Business and Wealth Consulting, is the Blum is my wife. She's a psychologist. She doesn't do the consulting work that I do, but our clinical offices uh, are together. I still do a small clinical practice in addition to my consulting work and I keep reminding her that even though you know she sees her clients and I do my thing we're very small no administrator it's just us and it feels like two separate businesses there's a lot we have to do together and we experience some of the same you know you know frustrations and joys so I, I think I'm in my second family business when you look at it that way so yeah I you know, came from uh, commercial printing and worked with my dad and it was just I didn't love commercial printing and it was a lot of tension between me and my dad and I decided, you know, especially since I wasn't interested in it, uh, to go my own way, went to the sales and marketing route, had a good run. We had a family therapy experience, my dad and I and then my mom and sisters came in around the tension in the family business so with a family therapist that was amazing, really stuck with me. So when I was, you know, off in the non-family business world of sales and marketing, I went back to grad school studied family and group dynamics, got trained as a family therapist, did a bunch of postgraduate work and trained as a psychoanalyst and, you know, started talk therapy practice. You know, it just early on by coincidence had a number of business families come for, you know, their marriage was on the rocks or their kids were acting out or whatever the therapy issue was. I got a real deep in inside uh, kind of view of the interplay of family dynamics and emotion as it interplays with owning a business, having the next generation become involved, who, who gets to be a leader, who gets to, you know, have ownership. And I saw the families really struggle with this on a really deep level. They weren't coming to me for any kind of business consultation, but they were talking about their lives and their heartache and their pain, as well as their joys and their successes. And I saw all of that magnified for these families that had businesses. And I just saw that there was an opportunity to help in a way that wasn't exactly a therapist, but wasn't exactly like an accountant or an attorney or a wealth manager. And that's where I got into this. So I sort of started in family business and found my way back in this role. Just really, really rewarding, especially when people kind of look to to manage that interplay of family and business well before it hits the fan, so to speak. Being proactive pays off huge dividends. So to, to get into it a little bit, Jeff, if you again, if you haven't listened to our last podcast where we talked about raising children in the context of family financial success, yeah, definitely uh, do that. It's, it was really a fascinating conversation that we had with Jeff. But we talked a lot about on our last podcast what age you should start or families should start discussing with their with their young children um, about the financial success. And I, I wanted to kind of start off with what age, if you are in a family business, should you should the family begin to start having those conversations with the next generation about possibly coming into the family business 
And how does that process typically work or how would you recommend that that process work with the family? Yeah, you know, it, it, a one or two or three year old, you're not deciding, although some people do decide that that is who's going to be the next leader. And so let, let me take this two different directions for the families that say, hey, I don't know if what this one or two or three year old is going to do with their life. A great way to approach it is to expose them to a lot of different things. So what do you expose a two or three year old to? You, you expose them to music, you expose them to sports. You know, you expose them to hikes in the woods and you take them every once in a while to the family business and let them walk around and let them see it and let them become comfortable with it. And as time goes on, if they're interested, there's opportunities to maybe make a little money in middle school, working summers, working after school. If they're still interested, it's, it's sort of a developmental process that starts with exposing them and see where their interest lies. That's track one. Track two, which you still see a lot of, and I think is really unfortunate is the oldest child or the oldest boy, simply because they're the oldest and they're the boy, gets locked in as this is going to be the next president. And I just finished 15 months worth of work with a family that was in that situation. The, the, the second generation was three siblings. This is the third generation was seven cousins. And uh, four of them were brothers and another three of them were brothers. And one of them, because he was the firstborn male child, there were, there were females in there, but they weren't part of this business. That's how the family was. This is construction. This is man's work. That's how they did it. But since this kid was really young, he was told, you're going to be the president. Someday this is all going to be yours. Well, now he's in his 40s, and he did not have what it took to be the leader of the company. And his, his generation didn't have faith in him. The older generation didn't have faith in him. And that's a real tough thing to undo. So while I started off by saying, who knows what a one or two or three year old is gonna do with their lives, some people believe they do know and they lock it in in a way that could be really, really harmful. The family example I just gave, there's lawyers involved now. And he sort of was either either fired or quit. That's part of what the lawyers are figuring out, but without getting into too much detail, it's a really painful situation where his kids are not allowed to see the aunts and uncles and parents that are in the business. And it really came back to expectations on a, a little three or four or five-year-old. Yeah. I mean, that is, well, it's interesting and probably sad with this particular family you mentioned is, you know, the you know, with normal, if you have a job and you don't like it, you can quit. When you have a family business and it's not working out for you, that adds a whole other dynamic um, to the equation. And it's almost like you're not quitting just the business but your, or your job, but you're quitting the family as well, I would imagine. Yeah, we worked with a family. We worked with a family a couple of years ago where dad was running the company. The son was coming up. He was in his 20s, very technical company. The son was pretty smart, but dad's plan was that he was going to take over the business. And we knew, Mike and I instinctively knew, that he was not ready to do that. There's not a big management team in place. If dad suddenly passed away, this $40 million company would be in the son's lap with no skill to guide or manage that that size of a, of a company. And, and the curious part of it, which always happens, is the wife inherited the stock. So now what? <laughs> so we see these these families that we work with, the succession of the business is their biggest challenge. They don't know what they don't know. So we, we kind of walk them through options like either building a management team, considering an ESOP strategy potentially, or have the stock owned in a, in a trust, not the spouse. So the, there's a lot of design issues around protecting those scenarios. But, but I'll tell you, the heart, the heart is strong. And he, he tried to convince Michael and I that he was going to be able to run the business and, and we knew better. And unfortunately, it's still in, mo in motion trying to figure all that out. But, you, but you're right, Jeff, it's a, it's a challenge when the expectations are the kids are going are gonna to run the business and all of a sudden they're 17. Nah, I'm, I'm going to go to the West Coast and surf or whatever it might be. So it's a challenge. And, and sometimes the kids aren't prepared and they want the role and the parent wants them to have the role. And sometimes the kids are really well prepared and the parent is unable to let go and keep their promises. I work with a father-son team. Uh, they had a good, a, a good distribution business years ago and I was brought in and the son by, you know, the, the non-family executives agreed, the advisory board people, their professionals agreed. The son had done everything he was supposed to and he did a good job and he was ready. He wasn't the same as the father, which is where sometimes fathers and sons or parents and kids of any gender get stuck. 
I was great at sales. I could, I could sell anything my son can. And that was true in this case. The son was not a salesman, but you know what? He hired salesmen. With the, tr the son did a lot of things that the father didn't. He professionalized the business. He professionalized their accounting systems. He did a lot of things well, and he hired people for the other stuff. And everyone agreed that he did a great job, and the father just couldn't let go. And it was a really unfortunate situation because the kid had been promised, like in this other example I gave, except this kid was ready, he had been promised, you know, you keep doing X, Y, and Z. And they were real specifics. If you can do X, Y, and Z in your 30s and your 40s, and he did, now he's in his 50s and he's waiting for an 85-year-old father to, to give him the chance. And the father just wasn't doing it. So the, the son did walk away. And that's an example of sort of quitting the business, quitting the family. But I think the families that do it right, it's optional. You're not locking kids in at a young age right. based on their gender or their age or their birth order. You're giving kids exposure and you're developing the kids. You give them as they're capable, certainly when they get into middle school age, if they're going to work, have someone who's not a family member, if it's big enough, to, to supervise them. If it's not that big, then a family member might have to supervise them, but be clear about what's expected, showing up on time, getting the work done, doing it properly, giving feedback when it's not done properly, and seeing if they can make adjustments. If they can't make adjustments, fire them. Maybe never give them a chance again, or if it's only middle school, let them try again in high school, but do it the same way. Here's your job. Here's the expectations. If you fall short, we're going to let you know. We're going to try to help you be successful. And if you're not able to, get rid of them long in the business long before it's a family ending thing. I think the families that do it well give family members a choice of whether they want to be involved or not. And they, they act like a business around who gets in the business, what position they get, and, and how much they get compensated. It's a, this idea of meritocracy where you, you earn a place based on proving yourself, and that's how you earn your position and your, your compensation, and, and then if you're not able to handle something, we'll try to help you develop yourself, but we might have to part separate ways. And when you make that clear, you know, in middle school and in high school when they're working part-time, they may just not be interested in the business, like I wasn't interested in printing, or they may not have the ability, or they may show that they really do have the ability, that when you point out that they're not doing something well, they can pivot and they can improve and work hard and learn and, and, and really prove themselves. Jeff, how do, you, how do you deal with, we struggle with sometimes or we see it routinely, when you look at that second generation or even third generation family member that wants to be involved in the business and, and has, has the motivation and the desire, the work ethics there, but you can't teach leadership. So when you, when you, when you look at a company's succession, leadership becomes a very important part of that equation. If, if that child doesn't have the leadership skills or the capability for leadership, but has a good, strong work ethic, how do you deal with that with these conversations with these family owned businesses? Yeah, that's a great question. And there's the question, there's a whole other podcast on can you teach leadership? Uh oh, don't uh, open I'm the can with, of worms. <laughs> well, I'm with you. I don't I don't think you can. And the example I gave earlier of the now forty year old who's lawyered up and has been told since he's a little kid this is all gonna be his, they they had tried coaching and they had looked at some pretty expensive coaching solutions. And when I came in, I said, based on what I saw, and part of it was from having a really strong clinical background, seeing that this was not a person who was capable of development. And that, as a matter of fact, he didn't even value it. He didn't even think that trying to improve himself was a worthwhile endeavor. So do you really want to spend you know, 50 grand a year on a top coach in leadership for someone who does not believe it's a worthwhile endeavor? I mean, right there, that tells you something. A good leader believes. I'll work hard, I'll, fig I'll take a look at my faults and my negatives, and I will try to improve. I want to add something to your comment. It, it, it's really, when you look for that leader or that person that drives success in companies, I, I see they have to have three basic attributes. One, they have to have strong work ethics, they have to have a vision, and they have to have enthusiasm. If you don't have those three, you, it's difficult to find a leader to run an organization. It's very hard to find that in one person to, to drive success. But that's what I teach our families to look for as they recruit to their companies or they look at their family members. That's the thing they should look for, those three components. Would you, would you agree with that? Um, I agree. Those are, are absolutely three great ones. I think also you need to be able to get get people excited about your vision. So it's kind of tied into that vision that you need to have vision, but you need to be able to get people to buy in and to be excited about sort of going for it. Like Michael did. 
Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was all going to be handed to me. That was that's the thing. No, I'm just <laughs> no Michael's learned every step of the way. Believe me, he's my sidekick. He's the best. Well, I well, you mentioned that that family, Jeff, or, or that forty year old who was promised, you know, that this was all going to be his. And I wonder, getting back to your last podcast of talking about challenges and successes and and how families manage that, I wonder if you have any thoughts on perhaps the reason why he doesn't want to go through that leadership training or he doesn't want to improve himself was because he was always promised that he was going to step into this role and he didn't really have to earn his right or develop the skills to be able to take that role. I wonder if that had something to do with it, which is where you're kind of tying in the two topics that we talked about today, which is interesting. Yeah. Take him through the gauntlet. I think there's some of that. Like you promised me, I did everything I was supposed to. And why isn't it coming? I don't want to jump through hoops for you. But it was also, so there's that part, and I agree with you that that's a piece. At the same time, there was just like a general worldview. So Carol Dweck wrote a book, The Growth Mindset, and she puts people into either a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. Fixed mindset says, I have everything I'm going to have. I have all my qualities and capabilities, and this is me, and working hard isn't going to necessarily make them better, and if I'm not good at something, I'll never be good at it. And the growth mindset says, I want to find out what I'm good at, what I'm not so good at, and I'm going to put in real effort to be good at things I want to be better at. And, and this guy had a fixed mindset. He felt like he was good and he had what he, the qualities needed and he couldn't even hear the feedback because they were willing to give him a chance. That's the thing. It wasn't like you'll never be president. They said, you need to develop yourself. You need to be better. And they were very specific. You know, you, you tend to really anger our employees. They don't respect you. Some of them have quit well-paid executives who have been with us a long time, quit and walked out the door. Before they did, they said, you know, you are a cancer in our organization. And if you don't get rid of him, it's going to fester. And he couldn't take that and sort of take a look at himself and make adjustments. John's original question, then it came back to me, how do you talk to these families? It's interesting. So I'm a Vistage member, and Michael, you're a Vistage member too. Mm -hmm. And I did a uh, office hours thing, it was called, where basically Vistage members could call in anonymously with issues related to family business stuff. And this was right on topic of that question, John, about how do you talk to families about this? So this guy was anonymous, and there were a few hundred people on the call listening, but no one knew who he was. But I shouldn't say he. First, it was a woman. And she's talking to me about this idea of can you coach a leader if they're not making progress? Are they coachable? And a lot of questions around that. I said, well, give me the bigger picture. I assume you're a family member in the business. She said, well, no, actually, I'm not. I'm the head of HR. The CEO is a family member, and he's right next to me. I said, oh, he's right next to you. He didn't <laughs> want to call in for this? And she said, well, no, we don't really agree. But he said I could call in, and he would listen. I said, well, come on. Come on the phone. Nobody knows who you are. What's going on here? And they talked about all the money they spent on various kinds of coaching and classes and everything and degrees related to leadership. And I said, you know, it sounds like you've tried everything and maybe it's just not happening. And your HR person is using this as a way to try to tell you your son is not cut out to be a leader and you're looking at danger if you make your son a leader and you're looking for proof that there's something out there that can make him into a leader. And he kind of sort of laughed and maybe even cried a little under his breath. Yeah. Um, but it was really interesting. And 300 people are like listening to this because he was anonymous. But it, it's, it's, it's really tough when you have this vision of your child, your son or daughter, make, you know, making this leap to, to leadership, and then it turns out that they don't have what it takes. It's going to be really painful, which is why my mantra is start early and develop and assess and, and, and help them. You know, developing is not just here's what we want you to do. Let's see if you can do it, and we're going to sit back help them develop themselves, do the classes or the coaching, but you also have to be realistic about what's possible and promising anyone, you know, future leadership before they've proven that they've earned it. I think it's just, it's, it's not fair. It's not fair to the business and, and all your employees who are counting on a good leader to keep, keep the business afloat, right? People's livelihoods depend on it. It's not fair to other family members who might be younger, but have more, more talent. I've seen the youngest female of several kids just be a, Cracker Jack, you know, Ivy League degree, Ivy League MBA, outside work experience where the brothers didn't have outside work experience and the sister not get the shot they deserve. I've also seen the younger sister in the same situation be given respect and people say, okay, you're not a guy and we've never had a guy in this position, but 
you blew away your brothers and their brothers support the sister. In a, in a healthy family, the brothers, the older brothers will say, man, you are kicking butt and you are the best thing for this business. So yeah, I wanted it, but I'm going to support you because that's what's best for the business. I like to say family business is a team sport. If you're a singles tennis player, go start your own thing. But if you're a hockey player, a football player, where it's all about coordinating with everybody else, that's family business. It's a team sport, man. It's not for singles tennis players. Jeff, do you see, and it is a, this might be a little off, off target, but I, I have to bring it up. We see occasionally that although the family members work well together, sometimes the in-laws get involved, yep. cause a little bit of riff. Is that is that something you see along the way as well? All the time, yeah. And families differ on whether, especially when you get past that second generation, you get into the third generation and beyond, the family has grown exponentially, right? You could have right. two founders, three or four kids. You could easily have 18 people without anyone dying, 18 people who all want to be involved in this, just making enough money in a business to support 18 people, let alone the next generation and everything that goes with it is intense. So as the in-laws start to come in, right, when the second generation gets married, boom, you have people from other families, right? The, the, the founders and their kids grew up in the same family. They have the same culture. As soon as they start getting married, you have people with different ideas about what's fair or how connected they want to be to your family. You know, they married you. They didn't marry 800 other people. I've worked with families along the way where there were 100, 120 cousins who shared ownership. Can you imagine 120 cousins trying to make a decision about anything? Did you say a bottle of scotch agree? every Friday afternoon on that one? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Just craziness. So the in-laws are a whole other level, and some families are really inclusive about in-laws and welcoming them and letting them, some families let them have ownership. Some families, there's prenups and other, you know, vehicles to make sure that they don't have ownership. And that can be explained in, in uh, productive or infuriating ways, right? There's better and worse ways to sell some, to tell somebody, welcome to the family. You'll never be a part of this or welcome to the family. If you want to be a part of it, there are ways you can do that. So I've seen families be really warm and welcoming because the family values about inclusiveness and love and they have specific ways of including, you know, in-laws and they can work there if they meet certain requirements and they could even gain ownership if they meet certain requirements. And I've had families that absolutely no, no in-law will work, no in-law will own. But in either situation, <laughs> I've seen it done well and I've seen it done poorly. But it's always a conversation, right, Jeff? It's always part of the, it's always part of the equation that, that has to be discussed because as you're correct. As the second generation rolls in and there's multiple family members, you have spouses that have something to say, not so wrong or right. They just have something to say because they feel they're part of the family and, and they, they expect some input. And sometimes you're correct. Sometimes families say, nope. Sometimes families say, yeah, we love your input. You want to be involved? Let's talk about it. So I, I, I think it's something to, to to at least put on the table right away. And we see all different variations of that. And by the way, most of it's positive. A lot of our families say, Jay, I love my, my, my son's wife. She's a sweetheart and I want to do something for her. And so that's, that's off, that's outside of the business side of things. But, but that's where planning gets involved with family structures where we, we help them come up with ideas and concepts around that. Right, right. There's so many creative ways to be generous to somebody without giving them ownership of a business they know nothing about or not really interested in. I mean, you, know, you, you guys see the complexity, but guys like you can get creative. And how do you how do you equalize the kids who get ownership of the business and the kids who don't? You know, yeah, that's why we like creativity. not shares and trusts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or sometimes an, an outright gift and nothing to do with the business sure. at all. I mean, fam exactly. this, families do it a lot of different ways, but you guys are really good at that stuff. Now, when, you, when it wins, Jeff, I mean, it, it, it wins big. Don't you see that? Yeah. In other words, when a family gets on board with all this, the, the, the business excels and the family excels long-term. Am I correct in that? Yeah, typically. And, 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 and it's beautiful to see. And the families where they, they really are like, we're going to put the business first. We're going to do work, what's right for the business. We're going to take care of our family because we love family. And it's not all about the business. And there's lots of family stuff that goes on that has nothing to do with the business. And some families are in, some families are out. It's just a really wonderful thing to see. And it's really just sort of heartwarming and beautiful, to be honest. Each year, our families, we try to get all the parties together at a family meeting, get the kids involved, and we have an annual annual discussion on what's going on with the family. So sometimes when you bring them all together, it makes a big difference. Do you do that in your practice routinely? Do you bring families together annually as you start to, as you continue to work with them? 
Yeah, and there's different there's different elements. Like some of it is just like family reunion, and I facilitate things to help the family understand the, the history aside from the business. And you got to remember for the in laws, you know, they don't want, who wants to sit and listen to somebody else's family history, you know, for half a day or a full day. And so I really try to include. It's important to include, you know, the the main business family because that's sort of part of the glue of this. But also to give an opportunity for people who aren't who married in to talk about their families. And a lot of people out there That's great. doing this kind of facilitation, I think, miss that piece. And it, it can be, I can imagine it would be infuriating to just have someone else's family rammed down your throat. Maybe my family was working class, but really awesome people. We don't have a business to talk about, but let me tell you some cool stories about my dad's you know, football days in college or whatever it might be. So I think it's important to, to even that out. But in these family meetings, there's like a family reunion type thing that's about family. And again, including the, the people who married in. And then you can have different elements. I mean, I recently did one on a lake, a beautiful lake in the Northeast. I said, bring, please bring all the, the young kids. They're like, what do you mean? We hardly have 12 kids that are between the ages of five and eight. I said, bring them. This is where you're going to start to introduce them to this and they can start to just understand it. And they were really hesitant once again. And I love when they're hesitant and they give, me, give it a shot because it always works out great. Kids are just awesome. They're, they just have so much expansive energy. And so I played a video of what this company did. And I don't want to say too specifically to keep confidentiality, but it was pretty cool. And one of the eight-year-olds said, wow, this stuff's great. And the kids were all going nuts. And the one eight-year-old said, who does this kind of stuff? And that was, I couldn't have been, you know, played better for me. And I said, stand up and turn around and face the family. It was like 40 people under this tent. And I said, say it again. She said, who does this kind of stuff? I said, please raise your hand if you had anything to do with the kind of really cool stuff we just saw in that video and the aunt and the uncle and the parents and the cousins and, and, you know, so many people in the room raised their hand, even older people who this young kid had no idea, like she had heard about the family business. She just didn't get it. Now it was connected. My aunt Marie was involved with what I just saw in that video. That's awesome. And the kids are excited. You're not making any decisions about who's going to get hired or who's going to be the next president. You're just getting, you know, some excitement, some connection, and there's plenty of opportunities for them to take a step toward it or decide they want to be separate from it. But yeah, those kinds of meetings are just super important. Oh, Jeff, this was this was awesome conversation. I think we're we're running a little bit out of time right now. Are there any sort of final words of wisdom, for lack of a better term, that you can impart upon our listeners who maybe are, are going through this this process of possibly bringing on the next generation in the family business? Lots of, com- lots of open conversation early on. Don't commit to anything specific. When p- have a policy for how family members come into the business and some ground rules about how that works and, and be formal about development. Don't just let them work there for a few years and see how it goes. I mean, you should do this with all your employees, but especially family because it's so tricky. Develop, 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 and just be realistic in your assessment of what they're capable of and what their interests are and what the company needs and just keep that conversation going and it should always be a, a happy decision for somebody to decide this isn't for me. I'm going to go in a different direction because this is what I want for my life. But I want to be part of our wonderful family. That should always be a wonderful thing, even if it's disappointing. It's a lot better than going into the business because you feel like you can't leave, or there's some kind of financial punishment, and then being stuck somewhere or even allowed into a high-level leadership position that you're not ready for. No, that's great. That's great, Jeff. Yeah, thank you so much for for joining us today. The, these last two podcasts with you have been just just really wonderful. Thanks so much. Thanks. Fun to talk with you guys about this stuff. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Uh, Jeff, before we sign off today, one final question: If if there's a a family business that's listening, or somebody that knows a family business that's listening, and uh, they maybe want to reach out to you, can you give our audience uh, the best way to contact you? Yeah, sure. Thanks. It's uh, Jeff. Savlov, so it's S A V as in Victor, L O V as in Victor. You can search Google Jeff Savlov, family business, family wealth, any combination, you'll find me. The website is blumandsavlov.com, so B L U M as in Mary, A N D. Uh, my last name, S A V L O V.com, blumandsavlov.com. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Gentlemen, this was a fantastic podcast. Again, audience, this is a two-parter. This is the second part. If you didn't hear the first one, go back and listen to that. More great, incredible information there. Uh, Michael and John, again, uh, you guys brought on a fantastic guest. Thank you so much for bringing them on. Our pleasure. No problem. This has been great. 
And the last thank you, of course, goes to you, the listening audience. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Copper Beach is not affiliated with American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., a member of FINRA SIPC, Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., an SCC Registered Investment Advisor. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of American Portfolios Financial Services, Inc. and American Portfolios Advisors, Inc. Any opinion expressed in this forum is not the opinions of American Portfolio Financial Services, Inc., and American Portfolio Advisors, Inc., and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy.